What's up guys, it's Dull Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Draken Knifel video. So this one, we've got the USS Samuel B. Roberts, guide at 208. So, uh, fairly recently, I want to say like a couple weeks ago maybe, we did the, uh, sorry I got the hiccups, we did the uh, Fat Electrician video on the Samuel B. Roberts, and that was really great. Uh, I don't, this guy, the Dragon Eiffel, usually talks more about, like, the ship specs than anything. Sometimes I'll t talk about the battles and stuff. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how, uh, these two videos compare. Obviously, uh, that ship went through quite a bit of chaotic, <laughs> uh, encounters, to say the least. So, anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. USS Samuel B. Roberts, DE-413, was a relatively short-lived destroyer. Okay, I asked this. I believe it was in the Fat Electrician video uh, uh, of the same ship, but th you see these on, like, so many different ships, all these different flags. What are they for? Because I've asked this in a previous video, but I don't think anyone commented the answer. I've always wondered this. Like, why are there so many flags on these ships? Court of the John C. Butler class. The destroyer escort or frigate, as it would later be classified, was designed to give the US Navy a quickly buildable class of ships optimised for escorting convoys and other slower ships. Unlike a fleet destroyer, the destroyer escort was not expected to keep up with a fleet screen, face destroyers in direct combat, or need to attack capital ships. As a result, the ships could be slower, at just under 25 knots, they didn't need a powerful main battery, and so the class would only carry two single 5-inch 38 guns instead of the five or six found on their contemporary fleet destroyer counterparts, and they only carried three torpedo tubes instead of ten. They were also a lot smaller than a Fletcher or gearing class destroyer. Although I was going to say, you can see the people on this, and like they're not very... They're relatively big compared to... One of the things I always find fascinating is just comparing the size of people on ships to the ship itself. Um, and it, it really shows you a comparison of how big ships are now. Uh, because, like, people look so tiny on ships now, despite the fact that the average, the size of the average person has gone up, I think, two, three inches over the last hundred or so years since you know, a lot of these pictures were taken. Although at just over 1,300 tons standard displacement, this still put them around about the same displacement bracket as many interwar era full size destroyers. So. What did they have that these older and more heavily armed ships didn't have? Well, quite a bit, actually. The destroyer escorts had a number of radars, sonar arrays, fire control systems, and an extremely heavy light and medium anti-aircraft battery for their size. Around 20 guns mixed between 20 and 40 mm cannon, in addition to the dual-purpose 5-inch weapons. They would also carry a wide variety of anti-submarine weapons, which allowed them to engage a submerged contact from practically any angle and provided all of this on a hull that actually rode shallow enough in the water that a number of torpedo types might actually run straight underneath them if they hadn't been adjusted for shallow running. Although a fair way down the list of initial build contracts, so vast and rapid was the building effort that the Samuel B. Roberts went from being laid down at the start of December 1943 to launch in less than two months, God damn. and was then commissioned at the end of April 1944, about four months after the first ship of the class was completed. It was named after a Navy cross -res Man, honestly, the U.S. like ship production in World War II, just U.S. production in World War II is just so impressive. It's honestly one of the dumbest things that politicians have done over the last like half century or so is outsourced so much production to China. Um, you know, other countries, it's a little bit more debatable on whether that was a bad idea or not. Uh, because they're not, you know, aggressive towards the West, and they're not our direct adversaries. But uh, outsourcing production to China was by far the dumbest decision that has been made in the last half century by the West. Right? Literally, the reason America became the economic superpower it is and the global military power it is is because it had the production capability in World War II to basically 
bankroll slash uh, supply, you know, m- have military supplies for basically the entire Allied effort. Um, and then you know you've had the de- the to, to a large degree deindustrialization of the United States, right? The hollowing out of the Rust Belt, and so many of those jobs have been shipped over to China. And and the craziest part is like China. The production in China, everyone always talks about how there's civilian factories, not military factories. It's like, so were the ones in the, in the U.S. before the war started. There were civilian factories, not industrial fa- or not military factories. They're converted to military factories rather quickly. Um, it's a lot easier to convert an existing factory than to build an entire new one. Um, and, yeah, China, the production that China has is insane. They went from not producing cars to produce to being the largest producer of cars in the world within, like, a three-year span, right? China is such a big threat, and we made it that way by outsourcing everything to them. Recipient who taken a tiny landing craft directly into the path of enemy fire during the Gradle Canal campaign in order to provide a distraction, enabling the evacuation of trapped U.S. troops. As it would turn out, heroically drawing the attention of a large number of guns to save others was a feat that the ship would also honour. After a shakedown cruise, the Roberts was deployed on its first mission on the 21st of August 1944, escorting a couple of convoys before being attached to Task Unit 77.4.3, a better known to the world these days as Taffy 3. Her total time on active missions had been about two months. Her assignment to the escort carrier force was hardly surprising. Even though the US Navy had many destroyers by this point, it had equally as many commitments and almost as many fleet carriers, and other forces that were in need of a full fleet destroyer escort. The slower escort carriers were supposed to be operating behind the front lines anyway, and screened by heavier fleet units, and thus their primary threats were likely to be Japanese aircraft and submarines, tasks for which the Roberts was fairly well equipped to guard against. And so, as with a number of other such groups, the escorts would consist of a mix of destroyers and destroyer escorts, when full fleet destroyers could be spared. Then, on the 25th of October 1944, the Rising Sun revealed the fleet of the Empire of the Rising Sun, Admiral Kurita's centre force bearing down on Taffy 3. The smallest destroyer in the Japanese force significantly outmassed and outgunned the Roberts, and the Japanese had brought some considerably larger ships than destroyers to the party in significant numbers. Much like Captain Evans aboard the nearby USS Johnston, Captain Copeland took one look at the situation and realised that the chances of any Taffy of Taffy 3 surviving were quite slim. But those chances might improve if his ship served as a distraction. And so, with little regard for the lifespan of the engines, since they were unlikely to be afloat by the end of the day, he ordered all possible power diverted and the steam pressure rose well past the design limit. Which uh, is some chat energy. The builders of the boilers, if nothing else. And the little destroyer escort turned hard about and charged the Japanese fleet at almost 29 knots, considerably faster than it was designed for. Ex- Man, that's like fucking just straight chat energy. Just like, yeah, we're going to die anyway, boys. Fuck it. Let's save somebody else. <laughs> Exploiting the lack of Japanese surface search and fire control radar to advance under the cover of smoke. Copeland decided that, well, if the ship was going down, he wanted a better-than-one-to-one trade, and so he selected the cruiser Chakai as his first target. A ship, incidentally, that was over ten times his displacement, <laughs> his secondary battery on one side outgunned his entire ship. So he did the most <laughs> logical thing, close to point-blank range, and engaged the enemy with every gun he had, right down to the 20mm Orlikans and his three torpedoes. Against all chance, the Roberts won the fight, tearing apart Chakai's superstructure with its anti-aircraft guns and smashing off her stern with a torpedo strike. God damn! <laughs> Roberts then moved on to the Chikama, which was caught in a crossfire between Roberts and the destroyer Heerman, expending most of her remaining ammunition load on the second Japanese cruiser, with some surprisingly destructive results from using star shells once the normal high explosive had run out. However, this luck couldn't last, and Captain Copeland faced an impossible choice. Sail on into the growing fire of the rest of the Japanese fleet, or slow up suddenly to evade it, at the cost of becoming an easier target for subsequent salvos. He took the latter option, but various Japanese Navy ships duly exploited the situation, rapidly accumulating hits on the poor old Roberts until the battlecruiser Congo tore a massive hole in her machinery spaces with a series of 14-inch shells. 
The order was then given to a band. Congo, that's an interesting name for a Japanese ship. I'm guessing it's not a reference to Africa. Like the African Congo, I'm guessing it's a reference to something in Japan. Then ship, and she sank 30 minutes later, taking a 90 of her 210-man crew with her. With the 120 survivors, including Copeland, who would later retire as a rear admiral much further down the line, being picked up, albeit no, just over two days later. The ship's exploits would be commemorated by the naming of several ships after both... Man, that would suck just floating in the fucking ocean for two days. Honestly, though, it's not... I've Some of the stories you hear about like people that survived in the ocean for like months on end, there was one, I think it would have been like four or five years ago, they picked up some dude... I believe it was off the coast of fucking uh, Tonga. It was somewhere in the South Pacific. They picked up this guy. He'd been floating in the ocean for like four or five months. He he had like one of those like small personal sailboats. He was actually like an experienced sailor too. He had like done the trip uh, from, I believe it was like from Hawaii to, um, I can't remember which, it was one of the islands that's like just north of Australia. But he'd done the trip like multiple times. But he got hit by a storm while he was sleeping, woke up in the middle of the storm, and his ship capsized, and he was st stuck on basically like the floating raft thing. And he was stuck out there for like, I think it was like four or five months just floating around. And nobody, like, they, they didn't find him until, I believe he was found off the coast of Tonga. Um, and he, he was alive, but it was crazy. Like, the dude looked like he aged like 20 years, had this huge ass beard. He, they showed like pictures of him like the day he left. I was kind of jealous. I can't grow a beard like that. But anyway. <laughs> the Samuel B. Roberts herself and her captain. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If Yeah, that, that ship is just complete chat energy. Just fucking, just, you know, fuck it, boys. We're probably going to die. We might as well go out in a blaze of glory. Take some enemies down with us. Go fight a ship that's got, like, what, 20 times your firepower? Because I, I think he said it was 10 times the firepower just on one side. So, Yeah. <laughs> they took it out too so anyway let me know what you think below like comment subscribe i'll see you guys in the next one